Bible says that the trumpet will so let Jesus take care of the sin problem. It is really a heaven solution, a God solution. That's our emphasis. So we have assurance of salvation. And there is no force on earth that can withstand what God is about to do. Welcome everyone once again to another episode of Whispering Hope, our daily Bible study uh, review. We are so happy that you have come by once again to view this interesting and intriguing lesson discussion. We have with us the ever faithful Elder Andy David. Elder David, welcome. Thank you very much. And we have the beautiful rose among the thorn, Elder Jacqueline Gordon. Welcome, Sister Gordon. Welcome, I'm happy to be here. All right. So we're going to get started this morning. I'm going to ask Sister Gordon, just give us a word of prayer. And then afterwards, uh, Elder David, could you just read for us the memory text for this week's lesson? Let us bow our heads, Almighty God and our Heavenly Father. Indeed, we are so thankful, O oh Lord, from, for the admonition that you have given to us through your word. But, O oh God, human minds often fail. So we ask for the indwelling and the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. So as we open your word, O oh God, you being the greatest teacher, will teach us so that we all will be drawn to you. Heaven will come down, glory for our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, our memory text for today is taken from James chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. All right, thank you so much. The memory text says a lot. This week, yep. we're looking at the topic the roots of restlessness, the roots of restlessness. And the memory text you tell that David just read for us, and it's there for a reason, he's saying that jealousy and selfish ambition, elders, exist. Where that exists, there will be discord and every vile practice. And it's very interesting because uh, today's lesson is entitled Ambition. Now, this could be a bit of a misnomer because I wonder if ambition is really what the title should have been. But as we get into it today, we will see uh, how this word plays out in terms of the actual details of the lesson review for today. So when we started this week's lesson, elders, we look at uh, one particular story. And this is coming from in the New Testament, in the book of Luke. And we see here that Jesus Christ having, you know, 12 disciples and having spent time with the disciples and in teaching them, instructing them in righteousness, showing them how to live and speaking about the kingdom of God, that they had one understanding or one concept. And that concept or understanding that they had would have led them to ask questions or do things or act in a certain way. And so this week, when we look at ambition, it's very interesting to see how some uh, disciples of Christ had uh, one understanding of what Christ was here for, and that would have led to certain things. Now, before we go on, when we speak about ambition, Elder David, what is that? What is, what, what is ambition? What does that mean? To me, the quest or the desire mostly uh, to better oneself, to reach for, for, for things. That's my understanding of it, used in a positive light. Okay, all right, Sister Gordon, how do we define ambition? Well, I will agree with Elder Dave, you know, that strong desire to pursue excellence, a strong desire to do what is right, to, to become what will disguise the limit. You dream and it materializes through ambition. But I think what this text, and this is where the, the root of the problem comes, when that ambition becomes selfish. Okay. Now we just use the word there, selfish. And it, that word is also in the memory text for this week. Uh, yes. Selfish. Let's look at selfish or selfishness. What is selfishness? I'm, I'm trying to just, just set up some definitions here before we move on. Mm -hmm. Self, how would you term or define selfishness? Pursuit to gratify oneself. 
Ah, excellent. Pursue to gratify. Seeking to pursue anything to gratify uh -huh. that brings about self gratification. Okay, self gratification. And and man, Elder David, you want to chime in here? You mean uh, what? What is the meaning of selfishness? selfishness. Yes. Well, uh, hmm. just wanting what I want. All right, want to satisfy. Want, just wanting to satisfy my wants. Wanting everything for me. Okay. All right. So we see selfish or selfishness and we see ambition. But in this lesson for today, we are focusing more or less on the passage of scripture in Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 30. I'm going to ask Elder Gordon, if you could just start with my reading verse 14 and onwards, and then I'll pause and we move on from there. Luke chapter 22, verse 14 and onwards. We're going to see how this story unfolds. And to see the character traits or maybe the misunderstandings of how the disciples saw Christ and his kingdom. And we're going to home in on those words that we looked at, selfishness and ambition. Elder Gordon, could you read first Luke 22, verse okay. 14? Yes. Luke 22, starting from verse 14, it says, mm -hmm. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. And he said unto them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me on the table. Okay, let, let's pause Let's there for a while now. Let's pause there. Thank you, Sister Elder Gordon. So we see here, Elder Gordon, that Christ was with the disciples. What were they doing? And what, what was this thing about feast and eating and, and, and bread and, and wine? What, what, what's going on there? Help us to understand. Well, it was Christ's final supper mm -hmm. before he suffered, before he paid that ultimate price. And I think it, was, it is so profound that every word that Christ spoke at that table, that final supper, before his crucifixion is loaded, pregnant with meaning. And he is speaking about the kingdom. He's having his final supper with them before God's kingdom. He's talking about the bread, which represents his body. He, he, he's just loaded with so many lessons. Okay. Elder David? Yes. As, as she rightly said, it is the, the, what we consider the communion service today, the Lord's Supper. Jesus was about to be crucified, and he was there with his disciples, sharing that last moment with them, all right? And I guess at that time, Jesus really thought that they would have really get what was happening, get the moment, right? understand what is happening, but somehow they didn't get it, all right? And uh, as we uh, are going to see, that must have hurt Jesus terribly. Okay. So we see here then, as, as both Elder Gordon and Elder David, you have just said, that it was a, a special or a very, you know, a very special moment, the communion service, as we know it today. It was actually the time of the Passover, but Christ was now instituting a new covenant, a new testament, in that he wasn't eating the Passover uh, meal. He was instituting the communion service or the sacraments. Okay. And so this was very, very solemn. But then something ensued, because we're talking about ambition today. We're talking about selfishness or selfish. So, Elder David, could you continue from verse 22 and onwards for me, please? Uh, it says here, the Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. 
Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord, lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? <laughs> you are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. All right. Thank you. Wonderful. So then here is it now, the story more or less ties up in those last <laughs> verses. The disciples uh, were advised by God that informed that so one of them was going to betray him. But then the crux of the matter for today's lesson is that they began to argue or mumble among themselves who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Now let's put this in the context, elders. Here it is that Christ is with the 12 disciples at this very solemn um, occasion. Um, before he would have been crucified. He's trying to show them uh, what they should do uh, in the remembrance of him, taking the, the bread as, uh, as representing his broken body and the, and the grape juice as the emblem of his spilled blood. But they, we see here, what do we see the disciples doing here? And, and how, how could this, why did the disciples get sidetracked from what was taking place on this very momentous occasion? That's an excellent question because it is mind boggling as to what brought about that transition from, if you notice in verse 14, <laughs> Jesus plainly says here, this is my, I am eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus was pointing them to his suffering. It was a solemn moment. This was their master who'd been with them for three and a half years. He's now saying to them, this is my last supper. I am going to suffer. He's talking about the bread representing his body and the wine representing his, his spilt blood. And such solemn mode, Jesus created that solemnity at that communion service. So what brought about that transition? <clears throat> How could it have entered in the heart about Paul One, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And that is still my bubbling. But the point is, as, as our memory text speaks to, that level of ambition where selfishness describes that ambition is all about me, myself, and I. So they're basically saying here, okay, I, we can sideline the suffering part. We don't care about the part. We can sideline the, the, the broken body. We're not interested in that. What we are interested in, because, this, because we're selfish, we're interested in, Lord, what position will I have? in that kingdom that you speak about, that is of your father. Um, Go right ahead, Elder David. I endorse all that Elder Gordon has said. And in addition, up until this time, Jesus spoke about the kingdom and so on. But Jesus would have thought that, that by this time they would have gotten it. When Jesus spoke about the kingdom, he was speaking about the eternal kingdom. But they were still thinking that Jesus was going to set up a kingdom on earth. And so they were fighting for position in that kingdom. All right. Now, the ultimate reason why they would have gotten sidetracked, and this I think is the heart of the matter, is that the devil was in them. And the reason why I said that, this thing about am ambition, wanting position, originated with the devil in heaven. Yes. All right. Lucifer was created by God, son of the morning. He was chief among the angels, and he was not satisfied with his position. So he was the first one who exercised that uh, unhealthy ambition. All right. And, and we all know the Bible tells us that the devil came down to earth. So the reason why they were sidetracked is because they misunderstood, first of all, and then they had a conversion problem. There was a conversion problem. All right. So that wherever we see people today exercising that or exhibiting that unhealthy ambition, we ought to understand that that is being motivated by the devil. That is an invention of the devil. 
All right? And I'll leave that there for now. We might come back to it. Mm-hmm. All right, excellent. I want us to look at one more text. Uh, it is Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3. Matthew 18, verse 3. Elder David, read that for us, please. And just as you find it. And we're going to see how Christ would have responded to the disciples. Having had that ambition or selfishness to self-exalt themselves or to be placed in a position of great importance and to lord it over the others. We're going to see how Christ answered them. And then we're going to look at what that answer means for us today. So Matthew 18 and verse 3, Elder David. And he said, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. Unless you change and become as little children. In the King James Version, he says, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is in Matthew when the disciples came to him and asked him about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And it was basically the same question they were asking in the book of Luke chapter 22. But look at the answer Christ gave. He said, unless you become converted and as a little child, because he used a child as an example in that particular aspect of the Bible in, in, in Matthew chapter 18. So Sister Gordon, how does a child, what's the, difference between, what's the difference between a child and an adult in terms of a child's expectation or the, in relation to what Christ is doing here? Why, why use a child and say, as a child, we, if we don't become as a child, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven? And also he says, unless or until you are converted. The analogy of children. Children naturally depends upon their parents or an adult. That's the natural tendency. They recognize that for them to eat, sleep, so on, it's all about what can their parents provide. Also, it has to do with the level of forgiveness. And we all have alluded to that so many times where children uh, don't care what happens to them, how much they hurt, in in twinkling of an eye, they're talking and laughing and so on with their friends. They don't hold on to this animosity and have it to a point where they have hardened their hearts. So that level of conversion, Jesus uses the child because the child, one, in my estimation, is dependent, dependent upon their parents. What Jesus wants from us as adults, as we understand his ministry, and even for the kingdom of God that is coming, Christ wants us to be converted, to have that childlike heart, that childlike ambition where our desire is to depend upon God, depend upon God for our life sustenance. And the ability to forgive. To forgive, absolutely, to forgive. So trust in God, Sister Garden, and the ability to forgive. Elder David, anything else on that particular response that Christ would have given the disciples when they were asking about the greatest in his kingdom? Any, anything else? Um, the conversion part, and I, I think she mentioned it too. Yeah, and I mentioned it earlier. He says, unless you're converted from the King James Version and become like little children. Now the conversion will result in the childlike attitude. So I think it needs to happen in that order. So the conversion is vitally important. Just before we move on, just to further highlight the the real cause of the problem, the real reason for the problem, we had an analogy early in the lesson about this aspen tree. The aspen tree is a tree that grows and flourish, all right, even in in adverse condition. Now, when they would have examined the aspen tree, they discovered that it, 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 it flourished the way it did precisely because of the root system. It had a very large and vigorous root system. And so it drew through that root system a lot of nourishment. And that caused it to flourish. Now, the thing is, we have to be careful where we are planted and what sort of nourishment we are drawing and from where. All right. So sin is really the heart of the problem. And, and, and we have to be converted and, and, and planted in Jesus Christ and, and send them roots deep into Christ so that we can draw our nourishment from Christ. We are told Christ himself says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Unless you are connected, you understand, you cannot bear fruit. So we ought to be like the aspen tree, but ensure that we are planted in the right place so that we can produce fruits, but fruits of the Holy Spirit, 
because he lives and reigns in our hearts. All right, excellent. I'm going to read for us a text uh, today from Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 37. And this, I believe, uh, sheds some light or even summarizes in, in some aspects the, the, the point that Christ was making to the disciples. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 37 says this. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. This is after Nebuchadnezzar went on grass, went as a, a lunatic, lost his mind, and his hair became matted, and he was on all fours, and he turned from being human-like to being animal-like. animal, animal -like. And then he got his senses back, and he, he says that those who walk in pride, he's able to abase. And so the disciples here, you know, ambition is good, because we, we, we try and tell our young men and our young women, our children, have some ambition, you know, try and get some trajectory in life as to what you want to do with your life or what professional career you want to have and so on. And ambition is a good thing. But when it turns to selfishness and it turns to doing the things that are just looking at you only, as we defined earlier in the lesson, then it becomes a problem. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that very well when he realized that, you know, when he says, isn't this great Babylon that I've built? Next thing you know, he's on grass, on the land, living off of the land as an animal for so many years. But we're going to move on and we're going to wrap up this morning. But I want us to look at one more, two more texts, actually. Matthew chapter 16. I want um, you to find for me, Elder David. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. And we're going to see how this ties into the lesson for today, speaking about ambition. Okay, Matthew chapter 16, 24 and 25, reading from the NIV, New International Version, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Okay, so whoever wants to save their life needs to do what? Lose it. Lose it. Mm -hmm. Here we have the disciples coming and saying, arguing amongst themselves, who's going to be the greatest in God's kingdom? And, God, and, and you remember the text we read right there in Matthew, that he's saying that if you want to, the Gentiles, sorry, have people that rule over them and they lord it over them, but it will not be so. And Elder David, you read the part where he talks about Christ saying that, you know, who's greater? He's at, who's at the table or who's serving? Mm -hmm. But Christ showed them, like, look, hey, I'm the servant. I am the true servant here. Sister Gordon... Mm -hmm. What does that say about Christ? What does that say about Christ? He, he's serving. He's not, ask, he's not asking them to serve him, but he's serving them. And he's giving them an object lesson in what he wants them to understand. What, what does that say about Christ? How, how do we see a picture of Christ there? It talks about humility. And that's why God says, a broken and a contrite heart, I will not despise. Christ was teaching them here about being humble. Con a converted heart is a heart that is broken, contrite, recognized that it's not about us. It is not about me. I am totally relying upon God. I cannot do it on my own. I totally rely upon God. So the fact that Jesus, even yours, I mean, look at it. Having worked, lived with them for such a long time, three and a half years, at his final supper, when he recognized that they were still not converted, when he recognized that Satan was still residing, taking residence in their heart, he still did not give up on them. And that talk about the abundance of grace that God has for us. He doesn't give up on us, but we cannot take grace for granted because one day the doors of mercy will be shut. And so here it will seem that Christ is still teaching them that act of humility, going down and serving them, teaching them what it is to be great, what greatness really means. It is about doing service for others. Absolutely. And I'm going to read for us from the book of First Peter, First Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6. Uh, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud 
and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the almighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So the word of God, he's saying to humble ourselves before him, and he will exalt us. Not for us to be running hither to and fro, jostling, fighting for church position or office, and trying to see who is the better elder and who's the better Sabbath school superintendent and who is the better uh, evangelist and what have you. Yes, we all must strive to do the goodness of God and do it to the best of our ability. But Christ is saying here that we need to humble ourselves and he will, he will, he will lift us up. And as we try and round out, there's some questions here that I'd like to ask to both of you elders. It says, why should keeping our focus on Jesus on the cross be a powerful remedy against the desire for self-exaltation, which... As fallen human beings, all of us are subject to. So the question is asking there, I want Elder David to respond first, then Sister Gordon. Why should keeping our focus on Jesus on the cross, remember we're seeing him on the cross, uh, be a powerful remedy against the desire for self-exaltation, which as fallen human beings, all of us are subject to. Elder David? Simply put, when I focus on Jesus and what he did at the cross for me, it takes the focus off of myself. All right. When I examine Jesus and what he did, when I look at where Jesus came from, who Jesus is. All right. We read just now that uh, where he said he's the greatest there, but yet he served. All right. When I look at what Jesus gave up, who Jesus is, how powerful he is and how low Jesus stood just for me. He subjected himself to death, and not only death, but the death of the cross. For me, a sinner, the Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet rebelling against God, Christ died for me. Every time I sit down and focus on that, self is decreased, self pushed to the back burner. So focusing, the cross is indeed powerful. When we focus and we see the love demonstrated there for me, for us, then the focus must come off of self and be placed rightfully on Jesus. Wonderful. Sister Gordon, same question to you. Yes. When I see myself a wretched sinner, when I see myself destined to die, destined to go down to a priceless grave, because that's the penalty for sin. And as the Bible says, in sin did my mother conceive me. So I was naturally born in sin. Can't do anything about that. Sin is wrapped up in my genetics. However, when I look upon the cross and I see Jesus, the one who knew no sin, the one who does not, the one who did not sin, the one who died for us, the one who suffered, spat upon, nailed to a cruel cross, and yet still, while he was being mocked and ridiculed and, and spat upon, imagine that. He could have said, he looked down the corridors of time and could have seen us in need of his saving grace. And even those who pierced him, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What an awesome God. When I see that, I recognize it's not about me. It's all about Jesus and Amen. what he has done for me. Amen. Amen. And Sister Gordon, we see the disciples not getting it. They didn't understand. They didn't get God's kingdom and understand what he's telling them for some three and a half years. We today, who have been, some of us in the church for many years, or say we would have found Christ or Christ found us so many years ago, my final question to you this morning, Sister God, how can we today, quote unquote, get it? How can we understand what Christ is saying to us and not be like the disciples who walked with him in person for some three and a half years and still not getting it? To understand who God is. To understand that the very breath that we are breathing comes from God. To understand that he has such creative power. To understand that he spoke and this entire world came into existence. To understand that had it not been for him, where would I be? 
to understand that he has paid the price for my sin. When I would have looked and understand all that, I must grow in grace daily. And we must understand this is not a one-time thing. And we are so thank God for his saving grace. This is not a one-time thing. This is a daily sanctification. It's a daily renewal. As, Christ, as Paul said, I die daily. Self dies, must die daily. And so as we crucify self and see Christ high and lifted up, and we are drawn to him with a broken and a contrite heart, it, at that point, selfish ambition must take backseat in our lives. Wonderful. Thank you, Elder. Gordon, Elder David, finally, same question. In addition to what Sister Gordon said, they did not get it. First of all, they thought that he was going to set up a kingdom there. One of the things that they would have failed to do is to really follow the prophecies because the prophecies would have said clearly that Jesus would have come, what he would have done, and so on. So, and so, so we should not make that same mistake, all right? Understand that he was going to come He's going to die for our sins. We saw it all throughout the Bible, even during the through, through the sacrificial system that pointed to the fact that he was going to come and die. And then he was going to go back and set up an eternal kingdom. He's going to set up an eternal kingdom, not on this earth. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we ought to ensure that we stay in the word. Elder Gordon spoke about daily sanctification. All right. We ought to live there. Stay in the word. Have a healthy uh, prayer life, right? Commune with God on a, on a daily basis, all right? And then we will really understand our faith will be increased. And then we really develop that relationship with Jesus Christ, which eventually will lead to our eternity. I would like to say one last thing here. It says here, we experience transformation of our values and ambitions. That's when we're converted. Jesus tells his disciples, trust me and rely on me as does this child. True greatness is giving up one's right and embracing kingdom values. I'll read it again. And I'm reading, this is an excerpt from the quarterly. True greatness is giving up one's rights and embracing kingdom values. We are talking here about unhealthy ambitions. Excellent. Well, folks, there you have it. Thanks to elders David and Gordon for bringing to us uh, the exposition upon God's word and the lesson. Conversion is fundamental and it helps us to find our true purpose and our true rest, more importantly, in Jesus. And so we implore you all to continue to seek God's face, spend time in his word and in meditating upon his word. Pray often, ask him to fill your heart with his love and he will make the paths straight in your life. Until next time, we thank you once again for viewing uh, Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Review. May God bless you. Have a wonderful day. In Jesus' name. When I get to heaven, gonna walk with Jesus. When I get to heaven, gonna see his face. Do you hear that, boys and girls? It's almost here. Our first ever children's crusade under the theme let's go to heaven together the jennings sda children's ministry is inviting all the boys and girls from the church and community oh yes we have so many exciting activities just for you come out and experience a puppet show craft time health nuggets and a special night to have fun in galore and whole lot more beginning at 6 30 p.m nightly from sunday 18 july and ending with activities on saturday 31st july 2021 all at the jennings seventh day adventist church let's learn about how we can be saved no matter how small we are i can't wait to see you there so many rewards in store be there